I'm sure each one of us have uh, some defining moments in our journey through this world that we really can't get out of our minds. Sometimes it's a thing that makes us sad or inadequate. Sometimes it's a victory or a success. I remember it was the uh, late 60s, and I was sitting in the mess hall of my college fraternity, and it was in the middle of the Vietnam War. And that's when they had a thing called the draft lottery. And we're all sitting in the room hoping that our number would be a, a high one instead of a low one. When I was there, I was classified 4D. Because at that time, if you were registered to go to seminary and become a minister, you uh, were not, didn't have to be drafted. And so I just kind of sat there. And one of my fraternity brothers, Tom, had an older brother who was already in Vietnam. And three weeks later, got the word that he had been killed in action. I've always felt guilty about that exemption. I'm thinking, why would becoming a minister be any more important than becoming a plumber, or a mail person, or a stay-at-home dad, or a millwright, or an office manager? And I think myself, my fraternity brother's older brother lost his life in Vietnam because he had the guts to fight for the freedom that we take for granted today. Vietnam was not very popular, but the people that served had guts, and many of you are Vietnam veterans, Korean War veterans, World War II veteran, and what you've done for us is beyond compare. I think of my cousin John, who was a prisoner of war for seven years. I think of my fraternity brother, whose older brother was killed. I think of Peggy's stepson, who was killed in Iraq. But maybe that Friday night, in that mess hall, at least for me, is part of why in our church we have such respect for veterans. Because too often we take you guys for granted, you men and women who serve our country. And if there's one thing our church does right, we honor our veterans and respect you and love you for what you've done. And the other thing is David Duensing. I don't know why I keep, I don't even know if he's still alive. I haven't seen him for 65 years, you know. But anyway, uh, David, uh, was in my fifth and sixth grade class back in school. And if today he'd be labeled special needs. But back then, David was just slow and different. Some said that he had had a head injury when he was little because he got hit by a baseball bat, but whatever. He was large and he was very slow. He was awkward and he was made fun of. I'm not, I'm not sure what you guys were like when you were in fifth or sixth grade. I was an absolute idiot. I, uh, I, was, I, I wanted to win everything. A wiffle ball in the backyard, recess football. All I wanted to do was win, and it didn't matter who had to pay the price. And that was back when we had recess every day. We always would pick teams. And of course, the two stud muffins were the captains. And they'd pick the best boy and the best girl to be on their team. And there was always David Duensing standing in the back with his head down. He was always picked last because nobody wanted him on the team. There was one day when I was a captain, and I was looking at David in the back. And I think there was a part of me back then that felt like, you know, Don, maybe you could pick David like first or second and make him feel good. Well, I didn't. I wanted to win. And once again, David was last. Maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe that's why we have such a soft spot for St. Coletta's. Or maybe we, why angels among us is so important to us. Or a day like today, when we're talking about young people who are bullied and they're not made to feel special. But anyway, all this reminds us that in God's kingdom and in our world, there is no room for putting any one of us above or more important than anybody else. A person's dignity a person's self-worth is an incredibly special gift. And we need to honor it and respect it and, if necessary, fight for it. Years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine. He, his family had a manufacturing plant, and they printed on all kinds of packaging. And I would go over there and see my buddy, and I would introduce myself to some of the workers and got to know some of them. And one day, I went up to a guy named Bill, and he was operating this big machine in the factory. 
And I had heard that he had lost his spouse and he was as a single dad back then trying to raise his little kids. And so I asked, I said, Bill, how do you do it? How do you get through the day? And I remember him looking at me and he said, Reverend, every day when I get up, I say to myself, you got to do what you got to do. That was his saying. Every day I get up, you got to do what you got to do. And I'm trying to think if that's in the Bible or not, but I can't find it. (laughs) But it was the gospel according to Bill. But isn't that true? I think of all the people in the prayer book, I think of each one of you, whatever you've been through the last week or two or three or four, and you get up in the morning and you look at yourself and you face your day and you do what you got to do to get through the day, to take care of yourself and the people you love. Well, we had men's club Wednesday night, and it may come as a little bit of a surprise that we do more than drink beer and eat pizza, even though that's what we do best. It was toward the end of the meeting, and uh, Gaylord wanted to speak. And the room got silent. And Gaylord told the story about a young lady that just started to work for him. Her name is Yessie, and she is part of a very close-knit Hispanic family. And on her own, she's only 22, she's had a tough personal journey. She's had to deal with some lot of things to kind of get herself back together. Well, she's married, she has no kids of her own, and she's the oldest of seven children. And her mom is a stay-at-home mom, and her dad is 49 years old. Well, her dad died suddenly of a massive heart attack. And with no income there anymore, they, the mom and the, the kids had to move out. Well, guess where they moved? They moved in with Yessie. And she has this teeny-weeny little attic apartment, the third floor of a house. And so now it's her, her husband, her mom, and her six young siblings, all in a small apartment. And I'm thinking what I was like when I was 22. Oh, man, I was so self-absorbed at the age of 22. And so what does Yessie do? She gets up and she, I got to do what I got to do to take care of my family. And after Gaylord tells her story, those of us around the table just look at each other. And we're not the most sentimental group, but there was a lot of mist going on around the kitchen table. And so one of the guys looks at me, it might have been you, says, hey, Rev, uh, how much money do we have in the bank? And I said, plenty. I move that we uh, give Yessie $1,000. Well, I second the motion. All in favor of the aye, and if you're opposed, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> And then somebody says, I'm going to give a little more on top of that. And somebody says, me too. And somebody says, me three. And then I'm reminded of exactly why we have bingo four Friday nights a year. You know, every one of us, like Yessie, each one of us has a journey. And it's in that journey, that's where God lives and where God speaks to us. I mean, Jacob, in the first lesson for today, (laughs) he tries to run away from his journey. And he even wrestles with God to pretend like he didn't do anything wrong. Well, in a way, we all wrestle. We wrestle with ourselves, maybe our faith, maybe with God. But ultimately, every day, you got to get up. And you got to do what you got to do to get through the day. And it's easy, I guess. It's in that that we discover that somehow God walks that journey with us. And you know and I know that angels come in all kinds of different packages. Maybe it's Yessie. Maybe it's a guy eating pizza in the kitchen, and tomorrow that angel just might be you, because that's the way God works. Amen. If you're able to, please rise for the creed. It's on page 105.